Do you want to learn how you can earn more commissions in business in sales by closing less people and spending less time closing them? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Aidan Rigg. He is a true sales practitioner, a selling expert. And on today's show, he's explaining what value creation is, how we can do more of it, and how it leads over time to you closing less deals that are more profitable that lead to more commissions in the long run and essentially make your life a lot easier as a sales professional. And so with all that said, let's jump straight in. Aidan, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Hey, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, uh, looking forward to uh, to engaging and uh, and uh, and talking about uh, sales. I'm glad to have you on. I'm glad to dive into value creation. I want to know what what that phrase means because I think different people can immediately have different perceptions of that. When you know, if you ask them, the first thing that came to mind. So I want to define it. I want to sort out how we can do more of it and how this fits in with the the wider business context of perhaps why we are even employed as salespeople. So start us off here, Aidan, of what is, I guess from your perspective, your definition here, what is value creation? Okay, yeah. Um, well, I'm going to back up just for a sec, and I'm going to uh, ask the uh, salesperson to put themselves in the shoes of their buyer. Um, a lot of times I think that we look at sales maybe from the perspective of us as a consumer. So if we're a consumer and and let's say say we're going to go look for um, a new a new phone a new smartphone um, we're probably going to make our decision based on okay if I've decided I want the new iPhone we're going to base our decision based on uh, whether or not the company's offering you know more data uh, a free carrying case whatever it might be and so we we're looking for more value or more free stuff for our dollar. We know we're going to spend so much on a phone. What else do we get? And so I think a lot of people get confused with providing value to their customers by giving more free stuff away. You know, free training, free dispensers, whatever it might be. I I say step it step back and look at it from a business perspective. And a business perspective uh, is what is value? Value is different from a company. And so the way a company looks at value is shareholder value or profitability. So how can you create value, which always leads to the to the bottom line, um, you know, top line, bottom line. So um, I encourage salespeople to kind of think of themselves as a as a sales executive, if you will, and how they might help improve efficiencies, um, uh, reduce times, expand time, whatever it might be, to add value to the company, as opposed to what I see a lot of salespeople doing is just giving free stuff. So, so value is is another term for profitability, as in shareholder value. And this ties in with seemingly automatically giving discounts, and the, your discounted price almost being essentially your your base price that you start off in negotiations. Is this something that salespeople? Or let me rephrase that. Is this something that sales management should, you know, give commissions on and motivate salespeople to drive profitability from the ground up within an organization? Absolutely. I'll give you a, an example. Um, uh, I recently led a sale to um, for a distributor, and I had the customer, and I told the customer from the bottom at the very beginning, you know, what the price they'd be paying was, and the price they'd be paying was substantially higher than the, what they have been paying. But there was a lot of different value, meaning they would use 30% less. Um, uh, there was just a whole bunch of value I built in there. So I went to the distributor and I said, here's the price. The price should be about $115, is okay, what I said. And they're paying 80. So, you know, whatever that is, it's quite a bit uh, of, of, of more value. And the customer was ready to pay the 115 the salesperson was so intimidated and, and unsure and didn't want to lose the business, they went in at $92. It was already done at $115. So it kind of shows what I experienced as the average salesperson is they 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 don't they want they want the the sale and they don't realize the the value they're giving away. They don't realize all the things that they're giving away that really they're 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 probably not making much money at all. 
at that $92, except for they have some cash flow. <laughs> and let me just turn that question on its head of, you know, clearly, um, whether it's directors, whether it's C-suite, whoever should be passing down these uh, the profitability quotas for salespeople. But for the salesperson who, you know, me, um, you perhaps, that's the the end user, the people who listen to this conversation that are, and I'm playing devil's advocate here slightly, but that are here going, well, I care, you know, this much about the company. I care this much about paying my mortgage at the end of the month. Should they, should they really be, bo or why should they be bothered? If you had to pitch us on this, why should they be bothered about pushing for profitability and and ca and n rather than just cash flow when they are commissioned on perhaps number of units sold versus how much they are sold for yeah and that's a great and that's a great question and and that's something that that um for years i got stuck in so you know we 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 all do it we all have done it but it's not something that we should continue to do so um i don't have the exact numbers in front of me right now but i, I do have it have it but you know if you're making roughly um uh, 25 points, 25 percent gross margin. Okay, you could give a 25 percent price increase, and you would have to lose 50 percent of your customers to be at the same gross profit level. So you think about that. Now, well, I'm not suggesting you give everyone 25 percent price increase, but if you did, you'd have to lose 50 percent of your base to make the same profitability. So what we're, what you're really doing is you're working twice as hard for that for that money so it's 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 stopping to no longer thinking about sales from moving a, a product but looking at it from an organization from a from an executive standpoint from a business standpoint and sit back and saying okay you know what if i give a 10 percent price increase i'm only gonna i can lose 10 percent of my base or or i don't have the exact number but i can definitely provide it and, and still be profitable. So um, we're not making more commissions by selling at a cheaper price. We're actually working harder and making less. So let me just let me just put in context, I think, for the audience. So audience, B2B sales professionals, if you are giving, uh, the, the math seems r crazy simple on this. If you are automatically giving everyone a 10% discount, you've got to close essentially 10% more business by the end of the year. You've got to close almost a month's worth of new deals to make the same amount of money as if you just stood firm on the pricing and then added more value to to justify that pricing, right? Uh, there's 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 uh, graphs and spreadsheets that 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 explains all this, but absolutely, and that's what I learned. You know, my first thing when I was a younger salesperson was um, where did I think the competitor was, and how close to that price? Maybe could I get an extra dollar or, or extra two? And I would basically quote and hope, and the customer would maybe like me better than the other person, and so they'd make their decision based on that. And as I've gotten older and as I've become more experienced and, and as I, I, I preach and teach is, you know, no one's saying you're going to be able to sell at list price. Not in today's world. You know, someone does an internet search and sees that they can get the same product or a similar product at $30 cheaper, you might lose that relationship. So you've got to be, you know, you got to be, you got to be um, insightful and educated on, on the pricing, but you definitely can earn more margin by providing more value and showing them like, hey, if they're going to make a dollar, and and they're going to pay twenty five cents more to make that dollar or save a dollar on labor, whatever it is, there's no argument from anybody. When you're asking them to spend uh, two dollars. And they're only going to make a dollar. There's a problem, and and so there should be. So it's building that value, and and yes, there's a fine. I'm never, never suggesting you can you can sell at list price. What I am suggesting is you can easily sell at 10, 15, 25 percent higher, as long as you're providing insight and educating the buyer and showing them how they save, um, in the process. And what does that look like, super practically here, um, from say? Someone is selling a B2B product, they're selling, Sam the salesperson is, in my world, they're selling medical devices to surgeons and procurement teams. Um, the surgeon is happy to pay whatever the heck they want because they want the new toys to play with, but the procurement team is battering them on price. What in that scenario can we do, so, and I like the way you phrase this, 
to earn more margin within the deal considering you know perhaps competitors are similar products perhaps competitors are similar pricing what can we do in that scenario to you know potentially do in that scenario to earn more value from the deal we know that customers are um competitors right they're competitors because we want to sell at a higher price and they want a lower price just as you know our suppliers are competitors we want a lower price and they want to sell at a higher price so we have to recognize that it's a game and we have to recognize that that we're competitors even though you're my customer you know you want a cheaper price as i do when i'm in that role so we have to recognize that that they're doing their job what we have to do is make sure that we are educating the customer and helping them with their goals and objectives. So if their goals and objectives are to enter new markets um, and you can provide value on how to do that and, and, how, to, and how they can navigate through that, that maze because of your experience, um, they're not going to bark at 10% more. Even if they did an internet search and said, well, you know what? I can actually get that for uh, 10% cheaper. After all he's done for me and helped me navigate through this, I'm not going to do that. No, there's a fine line. And, and, and that line is ba fine lines based on different scenarios. But, you know, you or me are willing to pay maybe an extra $25 or $50 for that phone. If the salesperson's been great, showed us how we can save, maybe how we can get extra data. We're not going to, after they've done all that work, bark over 10 over 10 15 20 dollars if it's 200 dollars yeah so we have to measure what that gauge is and 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 rightfully ask for that extra profit without being silly without going over you know over uh, uh that 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 fine line that that customer is going to be okay with so we're leveraging the law of reciprocity here of we're giving up front we're giving these advice we're, we're helping them out knowing that on the back end I don't want to use the word that we're guilting them, but essentially we're guilting them that we've given them so much awesome stuff, whether that be it, whether that just literally be insights and experience, or whether it be uh, you know more tangible that they then feel bad about questioning the price if the price is fair from the very beginning. Absolutely, let me give you an, an example. Um, I was recently, it was about a year or so ago, I was looking um, uh, to buy a house. So I went around with a real estate agent and and she took me to, I don't know, 20 different places and took me around and said, well, you know, you might not like this and pointed out things that I should be aware of about that particular house that I may have not noticed, um, which made me not want that place. Just all right. So then I had another real estate agent call me and and he said, well, you know, um, I, I work at we work at five percent. The other place was seven percent. Now, that's about. Ten thousand dollars on the grand scheme of things, um, I just didn't have the desire to, after all the work that she has done, to over over five thousand. When you're talking about you know a, a house and and you know five thousand, not really that much in the grand scheme of the sale. Um, I felt she deserved it. That I didn't even bother saying to her, well, by the way, would you, you know, drop your commissions. Um, there's nothing wrong with someone doing that. I felt that she had earned it, and um, I actually didn't really respect the salesperson trying to get my business by just low, saying he would do it at a cheaper price when when the other real estate agent gave all this value to me. You know, so yeah, the law of reciprocity. That's what set in there, and and uh, and and and, uh, and I paid her back by um, per, by allowing her to make more money off me, knowing that she made more money off me. How do we judge this? Is this a gut feeling? Is there a series of questions that we can ask? Because in the back of my mind, um, the scenarios that you've given us make total sense. If I'm selling to a, uh, or if Sam is selling surgical equipment to a theater manager who's got lots of stuff on, she or he would probably value and pay a little bit more just to have a great service that is delivered on time, everything's set up, the surgeons are trained on it. The flip side of that is if you're dealing with a professional procurement agent, which was uh, what I did in medical devices sometimes, it was theater management. They were kind of nurses first and management second. Uh, that was one scenario. But when I was dealing with procurement officers, they were then financially incentivized to get the lowest price, you know, 
have surgeons shout at them because the equipment's crappy and all they cared about was the price side of things you know i'm exaggerating slightly but yeah 80 90 percent of the job was to batter the heck out the salesperson and get the best possible price just to close the business even if it wasn't sustainable for the long term they didn't really care about that because that's how they were financially incentivized so with that said um aiden how do we suss out whether we are playing a game that we can potentially win or whether we our back is up against the wall and perhaps it's not even the best deal to be doing in the first place. And you're going to come across uh, certain people, certain buyers, that no matter what you do, they don't care, right? That, I mean, uh, it's price, price, price. Um, and you have to source those people out right away. And, 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 and you'll know by... You know, um, I remember one time doing a sales call and, and, and the, the guy asked me his price, the price. And I, I was coaching another sales rep and he pulled out his calculator and started breaking it down. And I just kind of nudged her, looked at her and kind of rolled my eyes and said, like, like, let's get out of here. And he looked up and he, and he could see I was not interested and, and he kind of stopped himself. I said, I said, yeah, you know what? We're not going to be the lowest price provider. So I don't want to waste your time. And he's like, oh, okay. Uh, and he was just weeding out the value. Um, there's value in me. There's value in the reps I work with. There's there's value that we provide. And so, you know, in that circumstance, yeah, you can provide a price. Say, hey, we dropped the box. Here's the price. Goodbye. Uh, but there is a large portion of of the of the industry, and I, and I don't know the the data. It's just from experience. I'm going to say at least 50, probably 75 percent of the market. Um, wants to wants to um, wants to improve the efficiencies of their business um, and and you can you can have the influencers tell the purchaser we're going with this person and that purchaser will fight back within a certain you know if, if it's 10 points 10 percent no big deal if, if, if you're asking the purchaser to buy something that is you know 30 percent 40 percent higher well he or she may, uh, push back. But when it's, you know, when, when you've provided value, you can get people on your side, uh, saying, here's what they've done. Here's what they're going to do. Um, and, and I've just, I just recently, uh, did that, um, with a customer I was, I was working with, um, they wanted to make a decision by July 1st. They already had, um, two suppliers they were testing. I got in there April the 3rd and, um, they went with, went with us, uh, the last week of June, and we were higher, and um, they had never heard of the company I was working with um, up until that time. But the insight that we provided, the the reduction in labor we showed that they could realize, trumped all the rest. You know, and she went to the purchaser and said, you know, this is why we're spending an extra um, uh, thirty percent, but we're saving it on this back end. And uh, and so she sold it to the sold it to the purchaser. So perhaps I oversimplified this then of the the I'm imagining this person in my brain now this horrible moody just probably slightly smelly procurement officer in a dingy office at the back of the hospital that no one likes visiting. And you open the door and the door creaks and she's immediately sneering at the salesperson as as you walk in the door. So perhaps I oversimplified things here of the value that you are giving doesn't necessarily have to be to the person who pulls the trigger. It can be to other influences in, within the account, right? And they kind of pile on in and, and give their thoughts and opinions. So I guess this leads to a bigger conversation of, is this where everyone who's listening to the audience now, everyone's listening within the audience now, sorry, should they be moving into sales roles, positioning themselves in sales roles where there is a big complex B2B sale because is is that the position where you can add the most value? And so you're going to be, you know, selfishly, you're going to be better compensated for that, especially moving forward as things get automated, as AI comes in and, uh, you know, online order forms get more and more sophisticated. Should we all be positioning ourselves in more complex sales roles? Because clearly some of the interaction we're talking about here can't be automated by software. Yeah. And that's a great, and that's a great question. And I think the, you know, I think, in my book, I wrote, I quoted uh, Gerhard uh, from uh, Selling Power, 
uh, you know, where he said in 2018, by 2018, you know, a uh, large percentage of the sales force, outside sales force is going to uh, be gone and, and will be replaced with technology, which in a lot of cases I think is going to be inside sales. And I do think that's going to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to determine where where you are. And depending on the industry, it could be a, you know, a, sm a laggard industry. It could be an early adoptive industry. Um, each each company or organization has a culture in and of themselves, right? There's 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 like if you went to um, Walmart, and I've never sold for uh, sold to Walmart, but you know they have a culture that you know what we don't need salespeople if it's going to cost extra for, for you to get this to us. We want lowest price. That is, you know, that's a market share sale. You know, and 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 there's there's salespeople and organizations that go after the market share sale. There's the WalMarts of the world that we sell to, but there's also the BMWs that we sell to, and and we have to decide of ourselves as a salesperson: are we a and the organization we work for? And I think a lot of sales managers confuse salespeople because they want them to make lots of calls and make lots of profit, but you really it's very hard to have market share and profitability. So you need to decide, are you a salesperson? Are you a Walmart salesperson? And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, are you a market share driven salesperson is what I mean by that. Or are you a BMW? All right. I mean, I don't, I would never think to try to buy a BMW for $19,000 brand new. I know they start at 50, you know, 50, they, you know, you, you know, they have the three class series that they'll, the 300, 500, 700, and their buyer is a fifty thousand uh, dollar a year person, hundred thousand dollar a year person, or hundred fifty thousand dollar a year person. They say no to a lot of consumers, of potential consumers. We need to be the same. We need to sit back and say, you know what? I'm not going after that business, or I've gone and made the first call, and they seem to be a Walmart type industry. Yeah, I'll give them a quote, but um, I'm not going to provide any value. So each company that we call on, and 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 I don't think you can categorize as industries. But it's the way that the culture of that company, they're either market share or profitability driven. And you need to, you know, you need to decide which one you're selling to. Do we get too desperate as sales professionals just to try and close every single lead that comes at us and close any glimmer of hope that we get when we're doing outbound um, sales? Is it the smart, and it sounds like a silly question to ask, but I think it's worth asking. Is it the smarter move to make these differentiations and then niche it down further and then spend our time going after the low hanging fruit as opposed to just every sniff of a deal that we can get our hands on. Absolutely. And you know, and, and, and I've studied strategy and, 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 and that's why I say salespeople need to be business people. They need to be sales executives. That's what they need to think. And, uh, strategy is a lot of strategy is what to say no to, you know, when Stephen jobs came in and re re revamped Apple, they said no to a lot of stuff and got rid of a lot of stuff. And yeah, and, and, and it's not the salesperson's fault. It's the, usually the sales manager's fault because he or she, you know, they have a job to bring in sales and, and, and they, 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 they just haven't sat back and analyzed and said, you know what, two new accounts a month bring in profitability rather than 10 accounts a month. Um, because if you're doing, you know, 10 calls a day as an example, you can't provide value to anybody. If you're going from a, a veterinarian's office to a, you know, to a, to a, you know, whatever, to a car dealership in the same day, you can't provide any value because you know nothing about their business. But if all you do is call on call car dealerships all day long or veterinarians all day long, you can provide a lot of value. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it's an epidemic, actually, of uh, salespeople going out trying just to get new accounts, and then the margin just gets squeezed because we're in a commoditized world, and a lot of the times we're we're selling something that the customer knows they can get something similar, or in a lot of cases even exactly the same from someone else, and so we're running around and 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 we're making ten points or or eleven points, and I'm not saying you should go after that business because. You can, but that's an inside sales job. That's that's you know that's someone um, to uh, where the, you weed out the costs. If you're you know the cost the company has for you, your annual salary, the, the you know the commissions, the gas, the insurance, all that stuff. Um, you know your job is to bring in the higher value um, business, 
And some organizations get that. A lot of a lot of the publicly traded companies get that. A lot of the privately held companies don't because they don't live and die by a shareholder, right? And 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 so all business is good business from a privately held company. Uh, a lot of times they think that. Not all, but uh, many of them do. And uh, and so I think if if the sales rep knows their objective is to get higher margin business, then um, uh, that low margin business can go to inside sales. It can go to, um, you know, um, uh, SEO or what have you. There's a different game for that. But from a sales perspective, a B2B sales perspective, you have to sell profitably and you have to go after the higher profitable business. Love it. You touched on something here and I think we'll wrap up with this. And I think this is worth kind of delving into just a little bit deeper. And that is, we're talking about profitability here. We're talking about, uh, you know, the market share, the company cultures these are all things that a typical sales well a typical sales trainer talks about product specifications and product benefits which is no use to anyone but then you get slightly beyond that and you're going into kind of the funnel and the process which is clearly useful to set standards and to move people forward and have next action points and to visualize the whole sales process but something i'm passionate about on the show is sharing the these wider business acronyms these wider bit of business knowledge and you don't have to you don't have to know the inside and outs of a financial spreadsheet, but I think it's really valuable for the audience so they can have greater, more impactful conversations with their customers to understand the business needs of their customers. So this leads to the question, how do we become, as you described before, Aidan, how do we become business people rather than just salespeople? How do we acquire some of this knowledge? Is there is there a process or uh, you know any books that you'd recommend or any way to go about doing this? Yeah, and that's that's a um, that's a great uh, great question. I mean, to give my own my own self a plug, the insightful selling I wrote um, a number of years ago now um, uh, t- touches on it. Um, uh, the second edition of uh, Spin Selling, I um, uh, can't remember the name of it. Not Spin Selling, but uh, uh, that that book. Um, it's Spin Selling, but uh, um, uh, the Price Driven Sale. It's called. Okay, the price-driven sale. Um, and so, yeah, salespeople need to educate themselves. I, were, I mean, most salespeople, you know, and, and, and of course, the great ones, the good ones don't. So, you know, I'm talking to the ones that, I'm talking to the person right now that, you know, was me 20 years ago and, and had two twins at six months old. And the commission check and because of, 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 of dispenser costs and stuff, my take-home pay was three hundred dollars. I have all these things come off the check, and I'm sitting there, and I've got a wife, and and a three year old, and two six month old twins. And it was at that moment that I decided that I had to work from nine to five at least every day, Monday to Friday. I wasn't going to get away from that. And so I could either invest in myself, or I could just you know listen to the radio and listen to the top ten. And so I invested in myself and I started with things like Brian Tracy, Anthony Robbins. Um, and then, you, you know, and then you start getting ideas and you get started being drawn to other things. So um, I would just say to the average salesperson, if, you know, if you want to take that next step, you know, back then there was just YouTube it, <laughs> just YouTube it, right? It's, it. it's, you know, just YouTube it. There's podcasts are free. You know, I mean, things like this. I mean, you've got 300 shows or more. I don't know what you, I mean, of, of the best of the best. Um, it's free. You know, 20 years ago, you would have paid for that. You would have had to buy a CD for 19 bucks, right? An hour when listen to it. So just the desire. If you have the desire, you will find it. And those things will come to you as well, because that's just a natural law of cause and effect. So cool. So Aiden, that's amazing. And we could dive into that whole lot deeper, but I'm conscious of time here. And so I've got one final question. That's the question I ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I'm not, I'm going to have to give two pieces of advice. Number one is I would pick uh, a audio cassette, a book, or a podcast, however you best learn, and and commit to at least reading one book, leading uh, a, a month, or one podcast a week, or a couple videos a, 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 a month, um, minimum. 
and 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 learn those you know and learn ideas and stuff from others. But the number one thing I would do is uh, you know to quote uh, you know a uh, Grant Cardone is is 10x. When you when you make 10 times more calls, when you um, when you just uh, put 10 times the effort, when you listen to 10 times more podcasts, 10 times more read 10 times more books, you just when you go full out, when you become obsessed with being the best in your town, don't worry about being the best in the world, be the best for your company. And then uh, when you become obsessed with that, when you become focused on that, everything else falls into place. Because even if you're lousy at asking questions, when you make 10 times more calls, you're going to get better at them 10 times faster. For sure. You know, and I think, I think the first 10, 10 years of my career, I, I had one year's experience 10 times. You know, I, I just, I had small kids. I was just, you know, I wish I had uh, put in that effort in those beginning years, uh, but it's never too late. I love it. I read that book and you, what you described is what Grant wanted people to <laughs> take away from it. I took away something completely different. And it was only from talking about the book and have people like yourself on who obviously enjoyed Grant Cardone's work and going back and forth with him over email um, that I, I'd made this distinction. So I read the book and what I took away from it was that you should 10x your goal. And then, and so I started doing this with the podcast of the original goal was to get 100,000 downloads a month. And I was like, hell, that's going to be amazing. If you get to that point, going to be so much cash going through. You're going to, you don't, you don't need to do the video side of things. You can just do the audio, focus on that. And what I took away from it was if I 10x my goal to a million downloads a month, which is what the goal is now, we're about hundred, we're, we're about, about 600,000 downloads a month at the moment. Unfortunately, it's going up in a super linear fashion. <laughs> it's very difficult to seemingly accelerate it. But when I did that, my steps changed. I couldn't cold call, cold email to get people on board. I couldn't just put out social media posts and hope that organically it grew. There had to be paid acquisition behind it. And so what I took away from that book is, you know, what you described then is the, is makes total sense. But what I took away was that if you have a bigger goal, the way that you would go about hitting that goal, if you're not insane changes. So I don't want to make 10 times more calls. I want to make the same amount of calls, but to 10 times more pro to use our conversation, 10 times more profitable potential customers. And I just thought that was a little nuance uh, that I wanted to add as well, because there's multiple ways to look at all this. And uh, the, the just the hustle and more work and more calls, that works to a certain extent. But to really take those crazy leaps forward, I think it's just a, a case of having the same end goal, which is 10x bigger, but then working backwards from it in a different way, perhaps. I agree 100%. I took that out of it as well. And I would never advocate, you know, making 10 traditional cold calls up down the street and stuff. But yeah, 10 X your, your goal, you know, you said, you know, a hundred thousand to a million downloads, whatever it is. Absolutely. Sales rep on the street, you know, they have a budget of uh, 300,000, you know, with your sales manager. Yeah. Then make it a million in your own head. You don't have to go tell your sales manager that, but right. But yeah, and make it bigger because you're right, because then you're going to find 10 times, bigger accounts, right? You're going to deal with bigger problems uh, because your your goal's bigger, your goal's higher. For sure, for sure. Well, with that, Adrian, tell us where we can find out more about you and then everything that you're doing as well. For everyone who's super intrigued to learn more about uh, selling with insights and selling with value after today's conversation. Yeah, well, the two main ways you could find me is uh, Aiden Rigg, A-D-O-N-R-I-G-G, it's different spelling, uh, YouTube and LinkedIn. Um, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, and uh, and you can search for me on YouTube as well. Those are the best ways. And then from there, uh, there's everything in the notes and stuff like that if you want to find uh, more information and dive deeper. Good stuff. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes. I'll link to a couple of your YouTube videos as well, which I've been interested in watching over the past few weeks as I've been pre preparing for this show. So I appreciate all that work that you're doing on top of all this. And with that, I didn't want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your insights. I want to thank you for joining us on the Sales Podcast. Thank you so much. Well, very much appreciate the uh, the opportunity.